The WCU Cougs are currently 4-1 after a loss to Boise State this past week. They are heading into a bye week this weekend. Next week, they will be heading to Fresno State. We'll make a Fresno State preview next week. But in today's episode, Dylan and I talked through the Boise State game, the John Mateer NIL news, as well as having on a special guest to talk through the Pac-12 expansion and potentially where it's heading. And when speaking of NIL, we gotta mention Black Label Supplements. They are the sponsor of this podcast and they actually have an NIL program. If you go to blacklabelsupplements.com and you are a college athlete, check out their NIL program. You can get some free supplements or at least heavy discounts. I personally use them for all of my supplementation as well, pre-workout, post-workout, aminos, creatine, you name it. Visit blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And if you are a Coug fan or a college athletics fan looking to purchase a property or refinance anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, or Idaho, I am a mortgage broker full-time, currently licensed in those states. Make sure to reach out to me and I'd be happy to assist. My contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, Cougs are on a bye week this week after the loss in Boise against Boise State, 45-24. We'll get into that game. Ashton Genty's an insane person. Dylan, you were actually in Boise. How was your experience at the game and in the city? The tailgate was fantastic. The Boise fans were very welcoming. Everybody was stoked. There was a lot of just camaraderie w- between the two fan bases. Fantastic barbecuing going on in those parking lots. I had 10 tickets in the end zone. Unfortunately, myself, I, I was one of two kooks. Um, And the first, you know, two and a half quarters were great. Um, and then the fourth quarter, let's just say, I, I left with some a good amount of time left on the clock. Yeah, and apparently that was the most attended Boise State game in the history of Albertson Stadium. I've I've heard and I've seen people commenting on my post game recap of how loud it was. The sound system in the stadium, like basically saying WCU needs to figure it out because Boise State has it locked down as far as the the fan experience and the game. What was your takeaway from all of that? Yeah, I, honestly, I feel like the game day operator or whatever you're going to call the DJ or whatever it is. I mean, there was quite a few times like pre-snap that, excuse my French, shit is just going all around you. And it, it honestly, to me, felt like it was kind of Bush League at times with with some of the, the audio that they were playing. But you're absolutely right. Um, it, it was electric. They have the whole light show. Everybody's singing garth brooks which if today that's not the thing you want to be singing he's not in the in the news for the right reasons right now but you could you could tell that the the game day experience was fantastic there and that is a very good football team i mean they got pressure on john mateer they hadn't gotten a lot of pressure on quarterbacks up until this point and really john was running for his life out there the offensive line apparently stayed in pullman they were nowhere to be found Mm -hmm. in that game And, you know, unfortunately for for Mateer, he just hasn't figured out the deep ball. He doesn't have the deep ball yet. And and there's certain things that we're going to have to be growing uh, with Mateer. And, you know, he said after the game that he's got to get that deep ball all situated. And Boise was able to, at some point, they switched to like a QB spy. Uh, You know, that first drive, he was able to break away for a solid run. He was able to get out of the pocket. But from then on, they were blitzing. They were showing him different coverages. He was trying to escape and there was just a guy on the corner or like you said, the offensive line just wasn't really there. Let's go to that third quarter. And when they decided to go for it on, on fourth and one fourth and inches, it looked like fourth and one from their own 27. That was really the turning point in this game. And if they end up punting the ball away, they're down to touchdown at that point in the game, they have a shot at really coming back. But you know, at that point, the defense is getting tired. Genty is absolutely dominating them. They figure that, they don't have a shot if they don't get it there. I hate that call to go for it there. What are your thoughts on that? I was not happy with it at the time. And, you know, they do have like a tush push type play that we've seen them bring out over the past couple of years. I would have liked to have seen them go with that. Mateer after the game said he's got to get that yard. And yeah, I mean, obviously any, a player is going to tell you that any time of the week. But when the entire honestly, defense the- stacked up on you. The defense was not playing that awful the first two and a half quarters. Yeah, JT ripped a couple big runs, um, but we did have quite a few stops, you know, in the first seven to eight possessions that that Boise State had. So 
You know, I, I don't agree. It was on the 27 yard line. There's so much time left in the game where, hey, you know what? Punt the football and go into your bend, don't break. But then, hey, they come down, they score right away. And then WSU put together a pretty good drive uh, where they linked up with Kyle Williams on that, that touchdown catch to make it 24 17. And then that bowling ball of butcher knives, as Chuck Pagano calls uh, Ashton Janty, went right through our entire team. Boise State didn't even need to really create massive holes for him. He would find a little crease. He would get in there, and then he'd break six tackles, and then he's off for 70 yards. I mean, he's a first-round draft pick, a first-round running back, if you've seen one. You know, you saw later in the game, like when the nail in the coffin was that play-action pass to the tight end for a 32-yard touchdown, and 10 of the defenders are going after Genty, and then they just bloop over to the tight end for a touchdown. I mean, when you have a, a weapon like that, you don't have to have the best quarterback. You know, their quarterback did make some good throws. He didn't have the best overall numbers, but that's just a that's just a weapon. That's why Boise is going to be what they will be this year. Yeah, I mean, 12 for 21 for Madsen, 184 yards, two touchdowns, obviously had that early pick. And going back to Mateer, you know, he ripped that 52-yard run. He ended the game 20 carries for 28 yards. That just tells you how. That's seven times for 67 yards, 62 yards, something like that. Yeah, he he was on his butt a lot. Uh, so I did not feel, and, and I told you this in confidence, I did not feel good about that game at all. Um, I, I was totally going into it with zero expectations. <clears throat> I, I bet on, on Genty to score two touchdowns. He scored four. That was like plus <laughs> 1,200. You guys averaging his, 200 yards a game. What's crazy is his betting lines the first three weeks of the season were manageable. Last week against the Cougs, he had to go for 167, 170 yards on the ground for it to be even money. And, and now they're showing the rushing lines against Utah State this week. It's like you're betting on the guy to go for 200 yards to, to just have a one-to-one -one bet. That's absolutely insane. One of the one of the bright spots, though, with the ball game was seeing Chris Hudson and Kyle Williams really break out. And this was the healthiest we've seen Kyle Williams look. He's been banged up nearly every game, uh, nearly every game up until the Boise game. There was something with him down on the field, taking a couple plays off. He catches nine for 142. Hudson catches nine for 126. Um, now, granted, some of that, you know, was kind of late, but. Um, I think there are some some things to build off from this game. A, you're not going to go into an environment outside of Oregon State that's going to be like that for the rest of the season. You know, Fresno State will have probably a, a decent environment, and especially, you know, with now us becoming Pac-12 members, I'm sure there's just much more buzz for folks to get to games, whether it's the Fresno States of the world, Colorado State's playing Oregon State this week. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting, and and – Fresno State's coming off of a butt kicking. UNLV gave it to him, and I, I don't have the score in front of me. I think it was fifty-nine to sixteen or something along the lines of that. And everything that UNLV went through with Sluka and their NIL and their quarterback just taking off after week four for their backup to come in and for them to not skip a beat kind of sucks that we don't have UNLV as one of those seven Mountain West Conference games this year because it's looking like this Boise State. Uh, UNLV game is a collision course for, you know, who might take that G5 spot playoff wise. Yeah, it looks like that was 59-14. That was at UNLV. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, their quarterback decided to move on. They whooped on Fresno State. And we'll get into a, uh, a Fresno State preview next week. But let, let's kind of shift and get into the the news that came out yesterday on John Mentier signing, signing an NIL deal with Northern Quest Casino. I believe the article said that this is like his third or fourth NIL deal that he's signed. He has other NIL deals with Miss Huddy's Barbecue and Pullman, Coog's First, Coog Fan. I venture to say that those those probably aren't paying quite as much as the casino might be paying. And it sounds like it's well into the six figures per year. So that that's pretty promising to, to see that a guy in Pullman is able to get some of that, that cash so that hopefully he could stay on the Palouse for a few more years. Well, here, here's the biggest thing, too, is Northern Quest Casino. Now you're starting to dip, get into corporate money for NIL. And that's the big aspect of where the Cougs can find that. And it's going to be either in Spokane, it's it's going to be in Seattle. And mm -hmm. last season, Drew Timmy, center of the, the Gonzaga Bulldogs, I mean, 
he was making, I think, upwards of 250 to 500 K with Northern Quest Casino. And um, I, my guess is I, I don't know the numbers with Mateer, but that's got to be north of six figures or, or mm -hmm. right around there. So obviously, hey, you go back to when we brought Cam Ward in from Incarnate Ward. Obviously, we kind of had the play bringing in, uh, you know, his head coach is the OC at the time. He links up with GMC here in Pullman, gets kind of the truck deal, and you had Cam for two years. Then he goes to Miami, and he probably got $1.5 million, uh, quite the bag. So well, he's got to play Cal this weekend at Berkeley. And if you've ever watched any Wazoo Cal games, you know how crazy it gets over there. Cal's 10-point dogs. You heard it here first. Lock it in. Take Cal with the points this weekend. It's going to get a little crazy in, in Berkeley. But, you know, great for John, great for the Cougs, and, and great for our for our NIL in terms of uh, the scope. And the quote is is from the Coug fan article. It says that Timmy himself said that he, while he could have been between 200000 and 500000 by going pro early, he actually stood to make more money by staying in college and receiving NIL contracts for his remaining years in college. So, so the amount of money that's being shelled out, and I'm just curious, it, it, you know, it, we're going to kind of going to be fighting an uphill battle being in Pullman for the, for the foreseeable future, because, you know, you perform here at WSU kind of like how some coaches go to coach somewhere to get the big job down the road. Now guys come here, they throw for a few thousand yards they're, they now have national headlines. They go play for, you know, University of Texas or whoever. Let's hope Mateer stays. But, uh, but, you know, the other aspect, too, is, I mean, Washington State really is QB1 University. You know, we right. go back to the Tim Rosenbach days. You know, obviously, Drew Bledsoe, Luke Falk, Anthony Gordon's one year, Gardner Minshew, mm -hmm. and, and, and Mark Rippon, a uh, you know, Super Bowl winner with the Redskins, uh, now the Commanders. Um, so a lot of quarterbacks have come through. Yeah, throw Cam Ward up there, too. But, you know, Johnny Mateer has come in first year. He's already got an Apple Cup victory. And, and simply for that, he's going to go down as a legend. Uh, you know, with the Ryan Leafs of the worlds, um, and, you know, and so on and so forth. This week's guest is Jeff Neusser, formerly a writer of Coog Center. He now runs his own weekly uh, newsletter, podcastversuseveryone.com, you know, mo mainly focusing on Cougar athletics uh, expansion and, and the new Pac-12. So let's bring Jeff on now. All right, Jeff, thanks for joining in. If you're watching this, you could tune in to Jeff's news article or newsletter at podcastversuseveryone.com. We want to hone in kind of on one of your most recent write-ups, which is titled Ignore the College Football Pundits. The new Pac-12 is already a win. Since that was yeah. published, Gonzaga has been announced to be joining the Pac-12, but can you just kind of hone in on some of the negative national narrative that is being spun right yeah. now in the Pac-12 and the, and the expansion? Yeah, well, what's funny is now that now that Gonzaga's on board, they're not quite as uh, loud about saying that this was a very stupid idea. Uh, I mean, look, it's you know, anytime you rock the boat of what people think the established pecking order should be, people are going to get mad and they're going to think they're going to call you stupid and they're going to, uh, you know, poke fun at you and mock you and and all that stuff. And that that's kind of I think what happened a little bit there, especially in. I mean, you know, Dylan, I know you, uh, you know, as a, as a journalist, like you kind of Connor, I don't know what your background is, but I know Dylan's, you know, done journalism work and it's like, you know, sometimes you, you know, your sources, you try to take care of your sources so you can make sure and, and get that scoop the next time. And, and the reality is, you know, national writers, I mean, they, they trade in favors just constantly. And so, you know, the fact that they all came out and were like, this is stupid. They should have merged. Um, like to me, that's just coming through that, that that's like the prevailing sentiment with the, you know, the sort of the four major conferences, right. The power four, just kind of like running through them and their mouthpieces. And, uh, you know, so it's like, yeah, you know, you're probably on the right track at that point. And also it just was not true. Right. So that was kind of the gist of, of the newsletter was, this is not true. This is definitely different than what is being left behind. Um, cutting off the dead weight, uh, does a whole bunch of things for you, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, improving your college football playoff chances to making a better basketball conference, which improves your, uh, you know, NCAA tournament chances. And then the other thing is, you know, if, if, you know, if stuff does go down 
uh, in five years or whatever, you're left with a conference that perhaps is attractive enough to be absorbed somewhere or, you know, the other way around, right? If, if somebody's kind of left without a home, um, they're not sitting there going like, well, you know, we don't mind the top half of that conference, but you know, I mean, Wyoming and, you know, so I, I think that they've, they've absolutely played this right. And I also think that, you know, the, the sort of silence right now is an acknowledgement that, um, you know, we've circled back around the teams in the American, you know, so all the, you know, the, for the failure talk that they failed or whatever, you know, they're back around to where they started and now they've sort of got, you know, proof of concept with not just the, the mountain West teams that have joined up with, you know, Wazoo and Oregon state, but also Gonzaga, you know, those American teams now have a long, you know, something long to think about. Cause as far as I know, as far as anybody knows, they didn't sign anything new or binding, you know, all they did was say, nah, we're staying, you know, which I mean, you know, we all follow recruiting closely enough to know that that doesn't really matter <laughs> until you sign something. <laughs> Well, and you know, the other thing too, is like, I, I think just the whole realm of college football just did not see Oregon state and Washington state just being a, yes. a, a toothpick in everybody's side yep. and deciding, you know what, like you, you mentioned it in the, in the story. It's like, okay, you can only wait so long to get yep. into the big 12 or this conference at some point you have until 2026 to get eight Mm -hmm. FBS football teams into a conference um, and you had a fantastic gift it's one of my favorite movies of all time Harvey Dent you either die a yeah. hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain yep. um, and that's kind of what happened um, up until like you said Gonzaga got added this past yeah. week and you know you obviously us Cougs we have a certain connotation with Gonzaga and a feel for it um, <laughs> obviously we need them they need us go into just how, how huge Gonzaga's addition is. Yeah. I mean, it's massive, you know, especially if you consider, all right. So I think we all would probably agree that Memphis is sort of the linchpin, right. To all those American teams. Um, and if you're, you know, Memphis is a school that fancies itself a, you know, a, a, a like a sleeping giant in the college basketball world, right. They hire, you know, Penny Hardaway it hasn't really worked out, but it's like, you know, you just, that's the, that's the stratosphere they want to be in. And so you add what, you know, again, we, we all have our feelings about Gonzaga, but you add, you know, what is, you know, truly the West coast's, you know, elite premier program to the top of the conference. And, and really, I mean, like the big East, is a great example of when, when you have one heavyweight at the top, it just sort of changes the equation for everybody. Um, you know, the rest of the big East is strong, but you put UConn at the top of that. And now it's like this elite, you know, basketball, uh, conference. And of course we see it in football as well, you know, with, you know, you take the big 10, which, you know, by most measures is not that great, but you know, when you throw, you know, Ohio state or Michigan, you know, at the top of that, when they're at the top of their game, all of a sudden that really, and that was, you know, honestly the downfall of the PAC 12, right. USC or whoever wasn't able to to do that. And so adding Gonzaga from a basketball perspective makes it attractive for those schools that, you know, fancy themselves a, a, ba a potential basketball powerhouse. And then that just kind of fills out, I think the rest of the ranks. And again, you know, like the big 12 courted Gonzaga and uh, the mountain West in the past courted Gonzaga, right? Like, you know, and there was some thought that, okay, they were pretty close to doing the mountain West thing a few years ago. And then, you know, the West coast conference kind of sweetened their deal. Um, so, you know, this time when I heard that Gonzaga was floating around, I was like, ah, they'll probably just, you know, sweeten the deal again, but they didn't. Right. You know, and, and part of it, we had to pay for it. Right. We had to pay for it. But, you know, if, you know, giving Gonzaga that kind of a share and allowing them to keep, you know, have, I think that's the deal, right. Keep half the tournament units they earn, uh, and that allows you to land, you know, Memphis, USF and Tulane or Memphis and Tulane or whatever, um, that's a net positive, right? That's a win. Um, even if you're having to pay some money to you, maybe more money to Gonzaga than you'd want in order to make that happen. So yeah, huge, you know, it's, it's potentially a defining, uh, inflection point, both that and, and Utah state stepping up. I think, um, we're going to look back at those two and go, yeah, let, those were, those were the two big moments. So I keep hearing Memphis is, is that the school that everyone kind of thinks is, is next on the in line? And then do you think that they stop at eight or do they go right to 10? Kind of like what you're mentioning. A couple yeah. Other schools? Yeah, I think so. Memphis, I have, look, I, I have no knowledge, like no, like uh actual, like inside information, but you know, it's like, I, I think a lot of 
I'm doing what a lot of people are doing, which is kind of looking at what's out there and saying, all right, what makes sense? And I mean, I don't know if you guys saw, you know, the Memphis AD did a, a news conference about a week ago. And it was, I mean, that was about as come and get me as you can possibly get. Um, <laughs> you know, basically, he basically all but said, look, if it was a better deal, we'd go. Um, and so I think where we're at right now, so there's, there's some, uh, there was some, you know, reports on Twitter yesterday, the day before, or whatever, um, where, you know, people were like, well, you know, there's not serious negotiate to expect things to slow down, you know, whatever, cause things have gotten real quiet. And, um, and there was some stuff earlier in the week where, you know, it was like, yeah, Memphis, they're back around to Memphis. And I honestly, I think what's happening right now is that, you know, Memphis has probably agreed to something in just kind of somewhat principle. Um, because one of the things that their AD said was that, okay, you're, you're coming at us. Number one, you're asking us to pay a lot of money to get out. Number two, you don't actually have a media deal in place. Like you're coming at us with a whole lot of speculation, a whole lot of numbers that are just estimates, right? Like I can't make a $20 million jump for an estimate. And so my guess right now is that like, they've kind of hashed out, okay, if you can get to this number, we're in now go, go get that number. And I think that's kind of where it's at right now. And the other sort of like thing that's out there that um, I think kind of points in that direction is okay. Texas state, UTEP, right? Like those, those schools, like the, like as far as anybody knows, okay. So UTEP is signed up with the mountain West you know, Texas state is just like, Hey, we're not doing anything right now. Um, I, I don't, they haven't been contacted by the PAC 12. So I, I really just think it's all American. I think that it's, you know, now it's just a matter of, you know, coming to the table with a firm media deal, something that's like, Hey, here's what we give you for what you've got now. Here are the escalators. If you add, I don't know, a school from Tennessee that, you know, I mean, right. Cause you can't, name names, but, you know, escalators for adding, um, other schools that, you know, are just going to so happen to fit the description of Memphis and Tulane. So it really could be pretty quiet for a couple of weeks as they try to firm some stuff up. I mean, you guys know how long it took last time there was a media deal, uh, with these guys with the PAC 12. So, um, you know, it may take a couple of weeks, but I, I think they'll try and do it pretty fast. Like, I don't, like you mentioned at the top, I mean, I don't think they want to wait much longer. They want to, they want to have it locked in and ready to go so that everybody can, can sort of act on it. I think. Well, and, and you have just some players that ha are not at the table for college sports yeah. broadcasts right now. You know, you yeah. got, Hey, Apple TV has been wanting to kind of venture into it. You see what they do with their MLS broadcasts and their, and their baseball broadcasts and then Amazon and, you know, you have Turner sports. So there's there's quite a bit of of opportunity to to get these games in and then you know the aspect is you have that pack 12 after dark too where you have these later times for games um mm -hmm. but you know kind of kind of looking all right hey let's say memphis happens um and mm -hmm. and it it comes with the two lane now you got to think that with the the announcement with, from the pack 12 on gonzaga where it stated hey we want their input for additional teams just like the other six schools that were added what do you think gonzaga is looking as maybe just one basketball only school there was a lot of creighton smoke that just came out of nowhere today on twitter people yeah. are just saying yeah. things i mean yeah. that'd be great but i don't see them leaving the big east yeah. um yeah. We're, who, who's like the best looking chess piece out of the saint mary's you know you got the grand canyon who's the liberty of the yeah. west coast yeah, um yeah. just kind of going there yeah yeah, the, the God, I hope Grand Canyon's not on the list. That that's just like my thing, and that's just not even the necessarily even the religious aspect. That's just like when when you talk about, I, I think you know, obviously institutional fit has become a little more uh, fuzzy, right? In this, because you know, Gonzaga obviously is not the kind of institutional fit that the you know the Pac-12 went. But you know, when your conference, when the bulk of your conference is you know land grant state universities, state colleges whose, whose very mission is to, you know, serve the wider, uh, the wider good of the state, right? Like when Wazoo has a huge acceptance rate and, and Huskies love to get out there and make fun of it. It's like, dude, Wazoo is living out their mission. Like that's what they're doing. Like that's what it was created for was to serve, you know, like a wider population, a wider breadth of the state in, and to educate, you know, people in, um, 
you know, more practical fields, right? You know, your ag or whatever. Okay. So when you look around the PAC 12, it's mostly schools like that. So I think that whatever you get, if you're going to go outside that, there better be a damn good reason. Gonzaga, that's a damn good reason, right? And not only that, yeah. like the other thing with Gonzaga is, and I think this is the part that, um, you know, people don't always, uh, you know, talk about is, is they've, you know, the, what, what the men's basketball team has done is raise the profile of their entire athletic department, right? So they've got a great baseball program. Their women's basketball program is very good. Their soccer program has been kind of up and down, but you know, it's like everything has lifted right with Gonzaga's success. So to bring it back around to the original question, cause I talk too much is, you know, is St. Mary's in that area. And I don't think they are like, I think that's really a legit concern is St. Mary's kind of feels like men's basketball and right. Like I, I don't know that the rest of their athletic programs are, you know, in that kind of ballpark. So then you go, okay, well, well, who else might be, if you're looking West coast conference, you know, one, uh, you know, one school that was floated in our kind of our members on newsletter members only chat area was, uh, was Santa Clara. And part of that is, you know, location market, um, which is ostensibly the same kind of market as, as St. Mary's, but, um, you know, just a little bit more of a foothold and, and a little more money and, and things like that. So that would be that, um, you know, I, I don't really know what else makes a ton of sense, to be honest. Um, I, I think the goal, I, I don't know that they necessarily feel like they would need to add another basketball only member. Um, I think the goal would be to get to nine football playing schools plus Gonzaga. And I think that nine is kind of the magic number for football, because when you do, you, you know, obviously eight's all you got to have to meet your NCAA requirements, but nine is like for scheduling purposes, like it's expensive to pay people is, to play yeah. games that five, are not in your conference. Yeah. 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 And so that five you know, non-conference that, games as opposed to exactly. four. I mean, that's yep. exponential in terms of money. Yep. yep. It's huge. So, and if you play, there are probably a number of schools in the mountain West or sorry, the new pack 12 that are at the top half of the mountain West that if they had to schedule five non-conference, they'd, almost certainly be playing body bag games just to kind of get that fifth game in there. And then also their position to command a paycheck for those games gets weakened a bit too. So it's just, you don't want to be in that spot. So I think they really want, you know, nine, I could see them going to 10 if it really, really made sense. Um, you know, but I, I'd be surprised if they went beyond 10 football playing schools. Um, but maybe they do, you know, maybe they go 11 to make 12 and then, you know, that kind of, you know, fills out your basketball. I, I don't know. Like, but it's, um, I, I think, I really don't think they want to go huge. If they wanted to go huge, they could have done that already. And they could have just grabbed whoever to make a big conference. But I, I really think they want to keep it relatively small, relatively focused. They want to be able to be nimble if somebody comes available so that they're not doing, you know, the big 12 you know, 18 member, whatever ACC, 18 member, whatever, just to like, keep their heads above water. I think, and I think they're playing it real smart. I really do. I think that's, I think that's the wise, the wise move for sure. Last question before we get you out of here. A um, lot of smoke with Sacramento state. It almost seems like it just came out of nowhere, you know, 35 million in NIL that you know probably isn't yeah. raised yet, but they're saying it's going to be there. They've got a, a lot of money going into facilities, but you know, Wazoo Jobu, one of my favorite Twitter guys, he, you know, he says, you can't add a team that's going to be, you know, un unavailable to go to a bowl for two years. It's going to be on probation. Yeah. You And if they do go to a bowl game, you need that bowl money. But yeah. it's certainly interesting to see the likes of Chris Haynes tweeting about it. Yeah, I, I think all that smoke's coming from them, right? <laughs> like, I think that, yeah. you know, they're the ones, you know, and, and by the way, God bless them. Like, if they want to do it, you know, that's awesome, man. Like. And if you can raise all that money, that's fantastic. I mean, send some of it to Pullman. Like, you know, like we could <laughs> we could use that kind of NAL money for sure and throw it at a couple of guys right now. But it's, you know, I, I just don't, I don't see any way it, I, I just don't see any way it fits. Like I don't, you know, if you're trying to create a conference that is, um, you know, trying to separate itself from the rest of the football conferences that is trying to become like a top, three or four or five, you know, basketball conference adding Sacramento state makes no sense at all. 
yeah. like none. And so now do I think it makes sense for them to end up in the mountain West or something for sure? Like if they, if they can do that, that's, that's probably a win, you know, for the mountain West, but that's not, that's not a value add. I, don't, I, I just don't see anything there. That's like a value add like what, okay. So back to grand Canyon, right? Like, well, what's the value add there? Well, you know, it's a big school. They got lots of money and it's like, dirty money but they got lots of money and then uh they're in phoenix right so it's like okay you know there's there's something maybe there um you know sacramento state just you know that that doesn't move not the moving really. the needle yeah it's not moving the needle really <laughs> in any way but i hope they i hope they move up i hope it's awesome i hope they go to the mountain west and win the mountain west because that would be hilarious so let's do it <laughs> Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Again, to stay up to, to date on all things Pac-12 expansion, make sure to check out his newsletter at podcastversuseveryone.com. And we hope to have you on again sometime soon. As Thanks, well guys. as his podcast with Craig Powers, all right? Yes. Yep. Podcastversuseveryone.com. There you go.